it is possible that they may misuse the powers by altering the constitution. We have to respect whatever uh, parliament says to a very great extent. I would pity the government, pity parliament, where parliament will not know in advance if they are thinking of a social reform. In this case, I think is something which has to be re-looked at. On the 50th year of the Basic Structure Doctrine, Apurva Vishwanath speaks to former Attorney General for India, K.K. Venugopal, who has raised a note of caution. This doctrine is a form of judicial review that is used to test the legality of any legislation by the courts. It was evolved by the Supreme Court in the 1973 landmark ruling in Keshva Nanda Bharti versus State of Kerala. In a 7-6 verdict, a 13-judge constitution bench ruled that the basic structure of the constitution is invaluable and could not be amended by parliament. But I have no doubt whatsoever that uh, in the background of the Indian polity with uh, various uh, political parties exercising vast powers, whenever they get into government, it is possible that they may misuse the powers by altering the constitution in a manner which would not uh, tolerate uh, the democratic principles or even the preamble to the constitution. Now, in which case, what happens? Would it be a dictatorship uh, like uh, Germany during Hitler's regime? Therefore, it became necessary that some sort of restraint had to be placed on Parliament in regard to what it would claim to be plenary powers, not sovereign, but plenary powers. And therefore uh, came the evolution of the basic structure doctrine. Suppose uh, a very powerful Prime Minister wanted dynastic rule so that the Republic would be converted into a dynastic uh, uh, rule, then uh, what would happen? So suppose you wanted to destroy the judiciary and remove the judiciary or its powers. Suppose you wanted to amend Article 32, Article 226 and so on, which are the real uh, provisions which are used against uh, uh, the executive as well as parliament for the purpose wherever uh, they go against the government, against the constitution. It is then that uh, the basic structure uh, theory would come into play. In India, the origin was uh, through the Golaknath case. And the Golaknath case, uh, uh, where my father, uh, M. K. Nambiar, appeared and uh, was a lead counsel, that was a case where the issue as to the extent of the amendatory power of the constitution in regard to the constitution came up for consideration. Large and from the very beginning, that is 1950 onwards, there was a tussle between the Supreme Court of India and uh, the governments of the day. So far as uh, the promises which had been made by the Congress even prior to the constitution was that uh, they would bring in uh, uh, land reforms. And the land reforms meant that the Maharajas would go and the land should be taken over, the lands of the, uh, this, uh, of the Zamindars should be taken over, the lands of the very big landlords should be taken, and it would ultimately vest uh, in the tiller of the soil. The Supreme Court, from day one, resisted uh, these uh, reforms because they came from a background where uh, property was very important and for property to be taken over just like that with bare, bare uh, compensation or something which uh, did not gel with their uh, philosophy and therefore they struck it down. They struck down land reforms after land reforms and this resulted in uh, the, uh, uh, the government in power, the Congress government amending the constitution from the first amendment to the constitution onwards, 25th, 26th, 29th, they 
were uh, only for the purpose of neutralizing these judgments. But however much they tried to neutralize the court, the courts were striking it down. Golaknath was a case where they held that there was no power of amendment because the uh, article started by saying procedure for amendment of the constitution, in which case where was the power according to the court, which I think was uh, absolutely unjustified because uh, nobody would say that uh, you have the procedure for uh, amendment without uh, the power being implicit. The parliament had to again amend the laws and uh, Article 368 was requisitioned as the power of parliament to amend. You see, the problem really is this. If an amendment affects the judiciary, then the decision will be very, very subjective. And we have the example of the NJAC, where, so far as uh, this collegium system was concerned, where the judiciary step by step took over the power of uh, appointment of the higher judiciary, the original constitution under Article 124 gave the entire power of appointment of the members of the higher judiciary to the uh, uh, president. And in India, under our constitution, president means the president acting on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers, which meant that the Council of Ministers would decide who should be considered for appointment uh, and who should be in fact appointed. In fact, uh, in the constitution during debates, the suggestion was made that don't have it as consult, have it as uh, the concurrence of the Chief Justice of India. But uh, Ambedkar shot it down. Ambedkar said he's only one single person with all the weaknesses uh, or uh, strength of a human being. Now the alternative which was given by the NJAC amendment to the constitution, 368, was that so for the 124 also? Was that you would have a commission consisting of the three judges of the Supreme Court, perhaps headed by the Chief Justice, and uh, one law minister, two eminent persons. But the Supreme Court was not prepared to accept it. And I had argued uh, after uh, Mukul Rohudi, who was then the attorney, had argued very, very well, extremely well. And uh, it was clear that the judges were not uh, uh, prepared to accept his arguments. I stood up and suggested an alternative. I said under Article 142, you have been using it widely, drop one eminent person. Then you have three uh, judges of the Supreme Court and uh, uh, a, a, a law minister and one uh, eminent person, that is three is to two. You will always be able to put over your arguments. Uh, but at the same time, a member of the commission can agree with you or not agree with you. But that doesn't matter. They were not prepared. Now, this is uh, what has happened. Now, therefore, the result of this is, I'm quite uh, uh, concerned about the aspects which can be held to be uh, part of the basic structure. Otherwise, uh, I would say that uh, uh, there was no uh, uh, gross violation, as it were. There are cases uh, where uh, the courts have applied the law correct, I would say, very, very much in the interest of uh, the country. The judiciary, as is very clear from uh, the NJAC judgment, will not give up the collegium. That is something which they consider to be most important. And uh, therefore, uh, I would pity the government, pity parliament, where parliament will not know in advance if they are thinking of a social reform, whether that social reform will stand the test of the basic structure or not. For unless you have a pro procedure for advance rulings, as you have, as you have so far as taxation laws are concerned, 
excise duty and so on. The result of that will be that uh, uh, your the parliament will be groping in the dark, and therefore uh, they'll take a risk and say that look, we want this law; it is for the benefit of the people. But it may, if the court uh, uh, wants to interfere, uh, there's nothing we can do about it. You have to realize that the government represents the will of the people. And it is not that the people do not rise when the occasion demands. For example, we saw after the emergency, when she lifted the emergency and held elections, the Congress is wiped out of existence. Then with one year of Janata rule, and uh, which was not uh, satisfactory, and she came back to power with a great majority. Therefore, how does this happen? Now, that's because the people are able to understand. There is an underlying uh, uh, voice which tells them what is good and what is not good. Uh, therefore, you should, uh, uh, to a great extent, respect what Parliament does because the, what is said in other countries is that the judges are not elected. They don't have a constituency. They do not, uh, they mostly they come from elitist uh, backgrounds. They do not know the pulse of the people. They listen to a lawyer and the lawyer produces some material. The opposite party, the government, uh, also produces material. But that is totally different from parliament with, say, 500 and odd uh, members debating, uh, having a, uh, uh, this was the committees, and uh, committees which uh, 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 go into the whole, uh, the JPCs which go into the whole issue threadbare. They examine witnesses, cross-examine them, and then they finally submit a report, which is, uh, uh, voted upon. Therefore, this is an elaborate procedure where finally the people have to say. Therefore, you have to respect whatever uh, Parliament says to a very great extent. It is only in the rarest of rare cases where uh, you find on the face of it that what has been done is wholly unconstitutional, wholly violative. In Jay's case, I think it's something which has to be re-looked at. Even today, the, there must be some uh, security petition pending. Even today, the court can uh, still say that we will drop one uh, 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 eminent person so that the three judges will always have their uh, say. Mm -hmm. And uh, the law minister by himself can't do anything. Therefore, uh, uh, I I think that time has come in greatest of regard has to be given to Parliament because you have to proceed on the basis whether you have an absolute majority or not that it is the people who speaks to Parliament and their courts have to respect it.